interested in studying, why, um, you can click on the T at the top there. Um, there's like an arrow and a hand and a pencil, square and a T. If you click on the T, then you can type right onto the whiteboard um, and just tell me what you're interested in studying, what your goals are, what you're interested in hearing about today, um, anything in that space. And you can put questions in the chat as well. So the whiteboard space is anonymous, but the chat is not. So if you've just joined us, we're going to get started in a couple minutes. Just give a little bit of time for people to come into the space. And in the meantime, we're just writing up on the whiteboard. I'm just curious to hear what you're here for, what you're interested in doing. And I'm sorry, the one funny thing about the whiteboard is it does not like long sentences. Um, so I'll try to split those into sep separate ones if I can. Avery, you're going to see some stuff disappear, but it will come back. I hope. Sorry, I put you in red there, but... Avery, did you end up doing archival research as part of your work in musicology? That's how we get them. <laughs> Once you get into an archives and start looking at all the awesome material, it's, it's easy to get hooked. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Let me just get this comment. We'll probably just get started right at two. So we'll wait, a, I guess that's one to two more minutes before we get started. Just to make sure we're all here. We're a little small group today. Is everyone here interested in the archive side of things or do people have um, an interest in doing records management? You can answer me in the chat if you like. Okay. Hi, Kate.
Okay, so maybe we'll get started. Um, there's just a few of us here, but we'll get going and you'll have a lot of <clears throat> opportunity to get your questions answered as well. So, <clears throat> what we're going to do today in our about hour together is I just want to do a couple introductions, um, talk more generally about the concentration. So you already heard me talk a little bit about ARM, but bit more, um, a little bit more about the kinds of careers where people have ended up working uh, that graduated from the program and the ARM concentration. Uh, some more details about the courses that you take, um, both required and the, the suggested electives. Um, some information about getting involved. Um, also, we're very lucky to have an ARM student here with us who's going to talk a bit about the student experience, um, kind of how what the concentration is like from her perspective. Um, and then any questions, but I'm happy to also have you put questions into the chat throughout and I'll either kind of table them for the end or address them right away. Um, I can I can do both now. I've been doing this enough that I can kind of juggle both. Um, so yeah, if I, if I say anything and something comes up and it raises a question, then just feel free to throw that in the chat. And if you prefer to speak out loud, that's totally fine. You can unmute and speak out loud. If you'd rather raise a hand first, there's an option at the bottom. Um, there's a little picture of a person with their hand up. You just click on that, and then I will call on you to unmute. Um, so introduction. So my name is Karen Surtam, as you know. Um, I am an assistant professor in the teaching stream at the faculty. I am on contract. And uh, because I'm in the teaching stream, I teach a lot. Um, so I teach six courses each year, um, and a lot of those are in the ARM concentration. So those that take um, ARM courses end up having quite a number of courses with me. So um, I do have a lot of information for you about like the kinds of assignments that you'll do, what classes are like, and that kind of thing as well. Um, I'm also a graduate of this program, so I did get my master's in the program in 2008. Program was a little bit different then, but um, I graduated of the program and then I ended up working in a lot of academic archives um, before kind of coming back to the faculty. Uh, most of my experience is at the University of Toronto archives as an archivist who did a lot of different things, but especially worked with personal papers. Uh, so especially the records of prominent faculty members and I ran our outreach program. Um, but I did also work as a records manager at Victoria University, so I have a bit of experience on both sides of the, the ARM equation. Um, that's probably all you really need to know about me, but I might uh, open it up for Olivia to introduce herself to at this point, if you don't mind, Olivia. Sure. One moment. I'm just going to share my video, if possible. There we go. Hello, Hi. my name is Olivia. I am a second year student at the iSchool in the combined degree, combined degree program. So I'm doing the Master of Information in, with a concentration in Archives and Records Management and a Master of Museum Studies as well. And I completed my undergrad at York University with a minor in Art History and a major in History. Thanks, Olivia. So, as I said, the program is very much about records, right? Um, and this part of joining the profession is then you, for the rest of your life, you have to explain to people what records are. But records are all of that inscribed material that we create in the ordinary course of going about our lives and going about our business. So people that people and organizations that create records would be government bodies, companies, educational institutions, religious organizations, community groups, um, and then just all of us, right, as we go about our lives um, as individuals and as family members too, we gather records together in particular ways. So really it's everybody makes records as they go about their day in the ordinary course of their lives. Um, some of us pay more or less attention to our records and to our record keeping practices. Some of us have an email inbox that is just full of unread um, emails or read and not filed emails. And others, I have one student who gets his email inbox down to zero every day, right? So some of us don't really pay attention to, to records in our lives and some of us um, do either because it's a particular interest or we work in an organization where we really need to properly manage records so that people can do their jobs. 
in many different formats. So when we talk about records, some people have a particular idea of what we mean by that. It could be um, a textual document, like written down, like for example, we have a letter here about the university moving to standard time at the U of T. Um, records can be photographs, they can be sound and moving images, they can be maps and drawings and architectural plans. Um, and all of this stuff is now moving to digital too, right? And those digital records are also records, um, including here's a recent tweet from the U of T, which is a record of many things um, as well. So records come in all these different formats and in the program we talk about how we would manage all of this different type of material in both analog or physical and, and then digital form as well. So you probably already realize ARM is made up of archives and records management, right? And records management is talking about how we manage these records in their creating spaces. So those that create and have to manage records to use them for the reasons that they've actually been created, their primary use value. Um, but then on the archive side of things, we're talking about what records from all of that stuff we actually want to keep forever, um, however long we think forever might last these days, um, so that in the future people can understand the past, people can um, seek redress for wrongs that have been done against them, they can hold government to account, they can do historical research, they can understand their family or the house they live in. There's so many other reasons why people might want to use records, that's their secondary use value. And more and more, we're seeing a lot of overlap between these two fields. So my first job after leaving the program, I was both working as a records manager and an archivist in the university. So I was working with offices to help them organize their material and help them identify what would come to the archives. When it came, I would then arrange and describe it and make it available to our researchers. So more and more, we're seeing a lot of overlap. And even if you don't end up in a position where you're directly working in both fields, as an archivist, it's incredibly important to understand records management principles. And as a records manager, you might often be interfacing with the archivist who will ultimately take that material that has an archival disposition. So there's a lot of overlap between these two kinds of worlds. On the records management side of things, we're talking about supporting good record keeping practices within organizations, whether that's to help them actually just go about and do their business, um, to ensure that they're complying with legislation and to reduce their legal risks, um, and to serve as evidence of transactions and activities so that that organization can defend itself as well, can demonstrate that it owns that building that it owns, right? Or that it made this decision or that it properly cared for this material. So key concerns in the records management courses would be what constitutes a record in the first place. Uh, Professor Furness talked about this information management, knowledge management, you know, where do records sit within that world? Um, where and how should information be kept? How can it be kept securely? How can it be kept in a way that people can find what they're looking for? How can we ensure we're not keeping material longer than we need to or not long enough? Um, and then whether it should be destroyed or transferred to an archives after that period. And then now we have in the digital age, we have these kind of primary or original records management principles that were built around the paper world. And the question is, how easily can we just apply those to the digital sphere? Or do we need new models and new ways of thinking about how we manage these records um, going forward where we have databases and interrelated systems, where we have multiple people and offices accessing records and acting on records from different spaces. So this explodes everything and, and makes the work so much more interesting. So the types of kinds of topics that we would be talking about are, um, as I mentioned, Professor Foscarini has a, um, a course on record keeping cultures. It's an elective course which looks at how different workspaces develop a culture of information and a culture of record keeping and how important it is for us to understand that, again, that human element of, you know, this person who keeps everything just in case and this person who doesn't like to keep anything like all of that actually matters quite a lot in our work. Um, looking at people's particular information practices, 
Understanding the legislation is really key because record keeping needs to be done in compliance with privacy legislation, access to information legislation, and then legislation that pertains particularly to those records like health and safety legislation, for example, for an accident report. Then there's questions of access, privacy and security, who's able to access records and see them, and then all the system requirements that need to go into supporting a good records management system. On the archive side of things, and this is more my area of teaching, we um, look at basically the whole archival workflow. So this is kind of the traditional way of seeing the different activities that archivists do. So first we appraise, and that, by that I mean not it doesn't mean to determine how much records should cost uh, on the mar open market, but instead how we decide what gets added to the archives, what gets kept forever, what gets left out, um, how we actually acquire it and transfer the material into our possession or control, or, or whether we actually should build new relationships, post-custodial relationships, where we don't own and access and control community knowledge and information. Then we actually arrange the material and describe it so that it makes sense to researchers who can't just browse our stacks looking through boxes or browse our servers. How we actually preserve that, both in terms of, again, paper and digital. And then on the, the end side, how we provide access, how we do advocacy for archives, and how we do outreach. Yeah, Olivia, a few, I've had a few students coming from linguistics, actually, um, and they really bring a unique set of knowledge, I find, uh, and experience to this work, especially in paying attention to issues of representation, um, to issues of language, particularly in the archives, which are or too often multilingual spaces as well. Um, but often too, we are acquiring records that are multilingual. So if you have also experience in other languages specifically, um, that is really, really helpful and an asset to anyone that has that. But generally understanding the structure of language and signification and those types of things can, can aid you a lot too. Um, and I'm gonna get into careers after, so I'll hang on to that for now. And a big part, at least in my teaching, and again, well, no matter who is actually talking to you about this, you're going to get a different angle on what ARM is about. So here you're getting the Karen angle. But what I try to teach is like, what, what do archivists do? Um, how do they do it? Why do they do it? What are the theories underpinning that practice? And then how can we innovate? How can we rethink? Where do we need to rethink? Um, where is the innovative practice happening? Where is the innovative theory happening? So it's both theory and practice. It's looking at how concepts play out in the real world. And then also thinking about how we can change where we need to make change. So on the archive side, the types of concepts and issues that we talk about are understanding what is evidence and memory, um, how are records used for accountability and justice purposes, the concepts of authenticity, reliability, and integrity are really important to ensure that records can actually be what they purport to be and can do their documentary work. Um, issues of trust, trust in records, trust in archival institutions, trust in archivists is very important how we're constructing particular historical records, right? And what is the historical record that we're inheriting from um, you know, our predecessors who have their own sets of values and ideas about what should be remembered, where there are gaps and exclusions in our collections, how can we start to rectify those? Um, part of that piece is doing community building and partnerships, um, and then how we're doing this again across all media and formats, and how we in the archival world are adjusting our concepts and theories to adapt to a digital world. Here, so here you go, Olivia. In terms of careers, um, here's some of, so I've taken this from, we have a list of alum on the faculty website that are happy to speak with students, um, to do guest lectures, to come to events. Um, and this is what a lot of them are working. So we have people working in, in a whole host of other areas, but here's some highlights to give you a sense of where people end up that graduate from the ARM concentration. So we have the executive director of the archives with a Q, which is formerly the, the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Uh, she's a graduate of the program. Um, so community archivist, uh, we have a media archivist at the U of T libraries at Media Commons, um, an archivist and records manager at the ROM, 
um, a records manager and archives administrator at the Conseil Scolaire Catholique Monavir, Monavir, pardon me. Uh, we have a media librarian at the CBC, so working in media, um, an archivist at Seneca, another educational institution, a manager of records and information management at Ontario Health, at Cancer Care Ontario. We have a lot of people working in Ontario Public Service, um, records coordinator at the town of Aurora, so a smaller, um, smaller kind of municipality, uh, information governance specialist at Baker and McKenzie at a law firm. A few of our students have gone on to do records management in law firms. Uh, and I am analyst at U of T, working for our I, the U of T wide IT department. Uh, records and info analyst at City of Oshawa. We have a few people working at the City of Toronto at archives and in records as well. Um, and then, of course, we have students that also decide to go on to do doctoral work and take on academic positions as well. Because um, some, some people come to us to, you know, for the professional program and some people come to us for the graduate program to set them up to do further work in, in scholarship. Olivia, does that help to give you a general sense? Okay, in terms of the climate right now, it is obviously very much in flux. Um, as people are working remotely, as budgets seem to get reorganized, um, one thing that has been really quite hopeful, I think, for our students is that the government has invested more in the Young Canada Works program, which a lot of archives then use to hire contract positions um, to, you know, arrange and describe an archival collection or digitize material provided um, online as we're working remotely maybe it's in you know doing more outreach and access work as well um, so that's one thing and often our graduates will work some contracts before they land a permanent position that's very common in our field especially if you're working in the public sector um, but yeah the the career landscape is a little bit in flux but there is there are still quite a few opportunities um, and after i'm going to point you to some listservs that you can follow um, where you can see the kinds of job postings that are available um, and the association of canadian archivists if you're interested on the archival side has a job board as well and the iSchool has a job board as well that's very very useful to you as students especially um, so as I mentioned, the profession is kind of taking up recent calls, well, ongoing calls that have increased um, pressure, have put increased pressure lately on institutions. So one is um, we talk a lot about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and its implications on um, Canadian archival practice. Um, one of the TRC calls to action, well, several of them apply to archives, but call number seven calls on the entire profession um, to do a review of archival practices in light of the findings of the TRC. Um, and that uh, report that comes out of call to action number 70, as I mentioned, was just released this summer, um, the reconciliation framework. So there's a lot of talk in our community right now about decolonization, about reconciliation, um, the upcoming Archives Association of Ontario conference is specifically going to be focused on this topic. And then I wanted to highlight the work of two very recent graduates um, that are also doing really great work. One is Mosca Roque, who is working at the Institute of Islamic Studies now at U of T, and she's building the Muslims in Canada archives from the ground up. Another is Renee Saucier, who's working at the Archives of Ontario, doing a number of things, but one of them is doing better outreach to document the full diversity of Ontario as a community. So in terms of courses, uh, these are the required courses if you are in the ARM concentration. So each one is uh, like one semester, right? So that's the 0.5 credit. So you take information systems services and design, which is not specifically only an ARM course. Um, there are students in other concentrations that also need to take that course. Archives, concepts and issues is kind of the 
What's the prerequisite for all the other ARM courses? It's the course that gives you the taste of arrangement description, of appraisal. So we talk about concepts of evidence and memory. Um, it's kind of your introduction to archival theory concepts and practice. Um, and it's you know a little bit general, and then it, it goes from there. The last two years, we've been teaching this course in an innovative way in the faculty, which is to have a lecture component, uh, which Professor Seamus Ross, who spoke after me in the session beforehand, teaches. And then I run the tutorials for those sessions. So it's not a TA running the tutorials. It's myself as a professor. Um, and we split into smaller groups because it's quite a large course. And I have about 20 to 25 and run four one-hour tutorials where we actually do activities, we discuss the readings, where we put concepts into practice to really um, get at that theory practice connection so that the concepts, you have something to hang them on. And then we have managing organizational records that's typically taught by Professor Foscarini, who you met, um, the, who's the MI program director right now. And it's also taught generally by Tice Klumpenhauer, who is the university archivist at U of T. Um, and then that course, that's kind of your introduction to records management, right? The general records management principles and practices. Then we have appraisal. Um, so again, appraisal, I don't mean monetary appraisal. I mean appraising records to determine their value in the sense of what is the value of records to the organization? How long do they need to be kept in an organization? How should they be kept? And then appraising the value of records in terms of their enduring value or whether they should join an archives or be destroyed. Um, so in that course, we do, again, a lot of theory. There's a, a whole body of theory of archival appraisal, but we also try to put those theories into practice. Um, then we have arrangement and description. So if you want to be an archivist, we recommend that you choose to take arrangement description because that's the core practices and standards and theory behind how we actually organize archival collections, which is a very particular practice, and how we describe our, in the library world, how we catalog that material. Um, but there is an option here. So you either take arrangement description or you would take metadata schemas and applications. And this is for those of you that are interested in records management or broader information work, um, where you're learning a whole host of ways of organizing information and describing information. Um, I think, yeah, for those of you that don't know, metadata is information about information. So, you know, for a book, very easy, the title, the author, the length of the book, the publisher, that information. When it comes to records, we need to make decisions about what is the information about the records that we need to capture, um, what it is, who created it, when it was created, how it was used. Then you take two information workshops. I'm going to get into those in a minute. Those are cross-disciplinary spaces where we have students from across the MI program together in a six-week course. So you can see it's a quarter credit. Um, so you take two six-week courses in the winter term um, where you get to kind of meet with a professor and work with them on something that is something Sometimes something new to them that they're a field or an area that they're starting to do deeper research into or you get to do something a bit more hands on or you get to make something. I'll show you some examples of those in a minute. This minute. So this the, every year these change a little bit, um, but this is just to give you a sense. These are the info workshops being offered this year. Um, so we have pandemics and information, of course, uh, truth and reconciliation in, as it plays out in museums and archives, knowledge organization, equity and justice. Just go down the list. Research data curation, systems thinking, systems design the opportunity to work directly with the sexual representation collection with which Professor Keelty works with, um, innovation in times of disruption, another timely topic. So this is like, it's just an opportunity to kind of play in a different area, to expose yourself to new ways of thinking, to meet colleagues across disciplines as well. And then in terms of electives, and all of this is on our website under the ARM concentration section, uh, we have the strongly suggested elective courses, which is digital preservation and curation. More and more, um, we are obviously creating digital records, and we need to know how to manage and work with them. No matter what our interest is, we're, you know, as future professionals, we're going to be working with digital records. Um, and then there is a general preservation planning course as well. 
Other suggested electives would be project management. Um, sometimes we offer diplomatics and genre theory, so understanding um, specific genres of records. What is correspondence? What does it do? What kind of information can you get from it? How has it changed over time? Um, some co conservation and preservation of recorded information. It's another preservation course. Um, we have a brand new course being offered this winter called Digital Archives Workflows. Um, once you've taken all the required courses, you get a chance to actually work with a set of records and appraise it and arrange it and describe it and make it available using open source software that archivists use. And think about how the concepts that you've learned in the core courses actually play out in the digital world through doing hands-on work um, to prepare our students to, to be you know, strong on the job market as well. Um, this year, Specialized Archives is a course on community archiving practices being taught by one of our doctoral fellows, um, Jessica Lapp. It's a terrific course. This is her specific area of research. Legal Issues and Archives, also a great course where you learn about privacy and copyright, donor agreements, um, you know, understanding all the legislation that informs record keeping and archival work. Um, you have the option of taking the practicum course, um, which is different than the co-op, right, where you go out and, and work in the field. Um, the history of records and record keeping, not always offered, but is on the books there. I sometimes teach a course on personal record keeping and private papers. So authors, artists, activists, politicians, ordinary people, how do we keep records um, and how do we acquire them and manage them in archives? I also teach um, Access Advocacy and Outreach, which is an elective course, um, but I strongly recommend taking that uh, if you want to be an archivist. We look at how to provide access, why are some records restricted, um, how can we help people navigate those restrictions, how can we pr promote the archives, how do we reach out to new groups and get them into the archives using our material. And that's where there's a bit of overlap with Olivier and user experience, right? And thinking about, you know, the intimidation that people feel when they walk into archives sometimes. How can we reduce that? How can we build uh, welcoming spaces virtually and digitally or and physically? Um, then we also sometimes offer Managing Organizational Records 2, the Advanced Records Management course on digital environments. Um, Professor McNeil sometimes teaches trusting records, so looking at deeper at questions of authenticity, reliability. Um, this managing audiovisual material is terrific if you want to be a film archivist or uh, work with audio material. Um, it's a really great course. And then there's the photographic record, which is a museum studies course, but for those that want to work with photos, highly recommended. And then there's a whole host of, you know, complementary elective courses that you might want to take. Here's some of them. Um, as I mentioned in my five-minute spiel, right, like if you're interested in working in special collections, you'd obviously want to take advantage of the kind of rare book courses that we have. Um, if you're interested more in, in records management, maybe you're taking some courses in the KMIM, Knowledge Management and Information Management concentration, um, such as, um, you know, knowledge organization, or you're taking data modeling and database design. If you want to develop more of those technical skills and understand records in um, in organizations that way. But this is really just a bit of a list. You can browse all of our courses online and you can take any of these courses outside of your concentration and kind of build your own, your own kind of curated set of courses, right? Depending on where you want to go and what your interests are. Um, and currently this year, I am the ARM concentration liaison. So every concentration has a liaison and we're available to help you and advise you as well in making these choices um, to help set you up for success. So just a reminder, again, you have these other options, right? So we can make sure that you're doing some work integrated learning where you're getting some hands-on experience through the co-op option or the practicum course. Um, Olivia, can, Olivia can speak to uh, the combined degree program, which she is in, which combines museum studies and the MI. There's, again, reminder, they can do these collaborative specializations, which Professor Foscarini mentioned. Um, and then there's the thesis option if you're interested more in doing research and scholarly work and you want to take fewer courses but focus in on a particular topic. Okay, I'm going to stop 
going on and on now um, and and pass things over to Olivia to say a few words about um, the student side of, of the program. Thanks, Karen. So as I mentioned, I'm a second year student here at the iSchool and I just wanted to speak to you guys briefly about student life, extracurriculars and my experience. So one way for current students to get involved is through the Master of Information Student Council, which is essentially an elective group of volunteers that work to improve student life. They organize events and professional development opportunities. There's also the Association of Canadian Archivists, which has a University of Toronto student chapter where students in the arm concentration are encouraged to participate in chapter activities and liaise with the parent organization. And there's also a University of Toronto student chapter for the Association of Moving Image Archivists as well. And also there is a faculty of information peer run blog called Living the Eye Life that has really great articles about student life, professional life, academic. Uh, I really enjoy reading those articles. In terms of course assignments, there are traditional essays, but I've also found that there are other opportunities for me to apply course concepts. So for example, in my arrangement and description course that I took last year, we were asked to theoretically arrange and describe our own personal records, which was really interesting for me. And for the appraisal course that I took with Karen, we had to write an appraisal report based on a case study of um, different case studies with um, sort of examples of records and how we would handle it. And all of these projects really helped me to learn and apply course concepts in a new way. And I found that the required courses really provided a great overview of archives and records management practices. And I didn't find that I needed any prior knowledge uh, of these fields in order to um, excel in these classes, which I found made it very accessible for, for new students. Um, in addition, there are iSkills workshops, which are a series of free professional, academic, and technical workshops that current students can sign up for in the fall and winter semesters. I myself have attended a 3D printing workshop. This was before the pandemic, and that was a really great opportunity. We got to work with a 3D printing software. We got to make our own little 3D models. Um, I've also attended a resume building workshop job search strategies, a LinkedIn workshop, a coding workshop, and they all provided a really great introduction to new topics, new softwares, and I always really enjoy signing up for them. In addition, there is the Ask an Alum program, which is available for current, current and prospective students. And through this program, students can ask, uh, they can connect with alumni of the program to learn about their uh, their career development and their experience of entering the workforce, which is a great experience. And if you decide to enroll here at the Faculty of Information, the student services team are very helpful and responsive. I've always had my questions answered and having that direct line of contact has been really helpful for me. And um, pre-pandemic, the Faculty of Information, it's, uh, it's located in the Bissell building. And I found it very convenient that Robarts Library is on site. So I could gather material for assignments in between my classes, um, but the online offerings at the University of Toronto Libraries are also really comprehensive. Um, so far, I have not had to pay for a textbook. All of my professors have selected articles that are freely accessible through the UFT library site, which has been really great for me. Um, the professors at the Faculty of Information are very approachable. I've had no trouble emailing them or attending office hours, whether virtually or in person. I found that um, when the lockdowns hit in March, I was in the middle of my first year, there was a really quick adjustment to the online teaching format. And I personally found no loss in uh, education quality, which was really helpful for me. And finally, uh, my fellow students, they all come from diverse educational backgrounds. Some people are more science-based, some people are more arts-based. Some people have been in the workforce for many years and they're returning to school. And all of these different uh, perspectives really enrich our conversations because everyone has a really unique lens that they contribute. And I, I often find myself learning a lot from my colleagues as well. And that about covers my overview. Um, I'm available for questions about student life and Karen is available for questions as well. And I'm happy to help. Thank you so much, Olivia. And thank you for reminding me. I always think that 
the richest resource that I have in my courses is the students, honestly. Um, there, it's a richer resource even than me in the readings. I would argue um, the collective knowledge that's in our classes is just incredible. Um, and I love to just draw that out and get you into breakout groups and get you having conversations amongst yourselves because you all have a lot of experience and knowledge um, to offer as well. The students and the faculty are, are my favorite part of the faculty. They're incredibly engaged. I am incredibly excited about the profession, I'm really dedicated, and put in a lot of volunteer time as well into the faculty and making the faculty better, including Olivia joining us today. So thank you, Olivia. Um, if there are any questions for Olivia, feel free to put them in the chat as well, um, specifically around students or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, she's touched now on a lot of this, which um, last time I had this slide because I didn't have a student to come and help me with this piece. But I really, if you do decide to join the faculty, getting involved is really important. So there, we're all, you know, different types of personalities and have different ways that we like to get involved. I was never really a student group joiner myself, um, but I found other ways to get involved as well. Um, so one of those is getting involved in professional associations. Um, and as Olivia mentioned, some of them have student chapters specifically. Um, but the, also the professional associations themselves have committees that are all volunteer run and are always looking for people to participate and help out. And that's a terrific way to join a committee and work with archivists across Canada, or across Ontario, or wherever you're joining us from. If, you know, if heaven forbid we're still online and you're not in Toronto, um, you know, joining or even right now from where you are joining associations that are associated with your geographic region. Um, there's always a lot to do. There's events to attend, but there's a lot of organizing to do too. And doing that work with people is a great way to get to know people, to have people see what good work you do, and to set you up to, for future success as well. Um, and as I mentioned, there are two listservs that if you are really interested in um, the profession of archives and want to kind of be a little bit more plugged into the conversations that are happening, the jobs that are out there, um, the kind of these days there are so many virtual events and workshops and things. There's conferences. Um, that's not the link I wanted to give you. There are conferences um, that are at very, very reduced rates because they're virtual. Already the Association of Canadian Archivists Conference has decided it's going to be online in June. Um, it's, I think it was $50 to attend last summer and you could get that fee even subsidized and attend for free. Um, it's a really great way just to start to get involved in the conversation. I know at this point you're just thinking, do I even want to go to this program? But if this is what you really know you want to do, or even if you want to explore, is this what I want to do? It's really great to already tap into those professional conversations as well. Um, so yeah, I've put a link in the chat to the ARC and OWL listserv, which is um, archivists across Canada having conversations about their work, posting job opportunities, posting about events and things happening that you might be interested in. Um, and there is also, you can Google, the Archives Association of Ontario has their own listserv as well. Um, and also my other key piece of advice for our students, if you do join the faculty or even in preparing um, to join, is to find opportunities to get hands-on experience. It means that the theoretical learning, the conceptual learning you're doing in class, you have experience, you kind of have something to hang that on. Um, in the library world, right, we've all been in libraries and used libraries. We don't always understand the complexity of what librarians do, but we have that touch point. With archives, we haven't all necessarily gotten to do that archival work like Avery's gotten to do or to, you know, really see how archives work. And so any opportunity to get practice, whether that's volunteering or getting a job um, when you're a student or enrolling in those work integrated learning opportunities, I really highly recommend that to string your networks and getting that experience right away. So that was all that I was going to talk about, but I'm happy to take any questions. Um, you could put them into the chat or raise your hand if you want to speak. Um, I always love hearing other voices than my own. 
Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions about anything really. I've put a bunch of links in there as well as Olivia was talking. I'm sure you've noticed that to the different programs that she had mentioned. I don't think I caught all of them because there were quite a few, but to some of them for more information. The Help Hub is especially um, useful as you encounter, you have questions, you can see who all the concentration liaisons are, how well the program directors are, as well as our amazing student service staff. Um, that you can get in touch with as well um, if you have specific questions about the application process or anything like that. They're all really, really helpful. Yeah, Monica, so working as an archivist for, I haven't personally worked as an archivist for a company or an organization, so my experiential knowledge there is a little bit limited, but so your com a company archives is quite often not actually open to the public. So there are a few um, exceptions to that. So for example, the Scotiabank archives, I believe, has um, does do reference and provide some material to the public. But often a company archives really exists to serve the company, um, to keep kind of the organizational institutional memory, to keep records that help to support it legally and financially. Um, and so the work that you're doing is much more just embedded within that organization or that company and supporting the functions of that. Um, working as a university archivist means, yes, you're working within the university, you're supporting records within the university. You know, at the U of T archives, I'm making sure that the transcript office can access student files to verify, you know, when someone got a, a degree or what their grades were. But it also meant I was working with uh, faculty members, students, outside researchers, scholars, filmmakers, artists, all those people that are coming to use our holdings because we're a public archives. Um, and so helping a lot more on the reference side of things um, and doing research and digging through all that scavenger hunt fun stuff that we get to do in archives to try to answer people's questions by using original records. Um, it meant that I had classes and gave talks on archival literacy, how to use archives, worked with faculty members to design um, design assignments that they could use in their classes where students get to work with archival material. For example, there's like a history of physics course where they came in and we gave them a tour and we showed them some of our records of uh, historical physicists um, and then helped them as they did their research for an assignment. Um, so a little bit more outreach. I put on exhibits and things like that. If you're working for a company or an organization, you're you're using those records probably to promote and support that organization. So I know at Scotiabank too, they use you know photos of of the original banks, right? They document um, how those banks have transformed over time. Maybe they're putting together photo exhibits or using photographs um, in uh, marketing material and things like that. Um, so you're more kind of supporting again within that institution. And in a public archives, you have a much broader mandate to serve the public. Hopefully that answers your question, Monica. And again, that's just from my perspective. <laughs> But that's my view of it. Are there other questions? Are there other things you'd like to hear me talk about? Um, anything about the program, the courses, the assignments? Yeah, the differences between LIS and ARM. I mean, the core difference is that people that want to be librarians take LIS and people that want to be archivists take ARM. Um, in ARM, I mean, part of it is the difference between libraries and archives. So libraries are dealing mostly with published material. 
um, with um, they describe material at the item level they organize it by subject typically um, it's a it's a different tradition it's a tradition that's a little bit more user focused and that actually has influenced archival thinking as archival programs have joined these kinds of programs but um, on the archive side of things, we are more concerned with things like legislation. So whereas LIS copyright matters a lot, for us privacy and access to information legislation matters a lot. Um, but then all the legislation, as I said, that pertains to records. So we get a little bit more nitty gritty into policy and legislation as well. Um, in, our, in terms of how it plays out in the faculty, it really depends on the professor. Um, some courses, for example, are more theory heavy and others are more practice heavy. Um, but that's really the difference, I would say, is just the, the nature of the actual work. So in archives, we really do have to understand concepts of evidence and memory, um, how, to, to, how a record can be authentic evidence of the past, um, a bit more connection to historiography. Um, yeah. Those would be kind of the focuses, whereas LIS, um, you know, focuses on bibliographic control, how we organize a catalog books, um, and and then now e-journals and that kind of material, um, how they work with publics um, to provide access to that information. A lot of people do a combo, LIS and ARM concentration. That's one of the most popular combos still for ARM students is to do LIS as well. It's very, very common. Um, but also you can, again, choose to do one of the concentrations, but then take courses in the other concentration without having to take all the required courses for it to actually be an official concentration, right? So if you're interested in both LIS and ARM, but you're more interested in archives, you could take ARM and then, you know, take a few courses from LIS. Um, to supplement. So whether, again, rare book librarianship or you're more interested in reference, you could take their reference course um, and then it can help to inform, you know, it, they help to inform both ways. There is a lot of overlap and all my work as an archivist was happening within the context of a library. It was an archives that was situa situated within a library. Um, and the fact that I did both myself as a student um, I took a lot of library courses. The fact that I understood, you know, what librarians do, what kinds of things they talk about, what are their interests really helped me to um, sit on committees with them and to talk to them about what archives do and what our needs were and to make sure that we had a voice within the larger library system. Um, so there is a lot of kind of synchronicity between the two. Okay, good. I'm glad that was helpful because I wasn't quite sure. Um, but yeah, it's the fact that I mean, really, that we deal with unpublished material and then all of all that comes with, right? Like, for example, privacy concerns. If you're a student at the U of T, you don't want the U of T archives, you know, digitizing your student file and putting it online. Whereas for libraries, 99 to 100 material, you know, could conceivably be digitized and put online and made available um, other than copyright concerns. But there aren't those kind of ethical privacy concerns with with material, for example. So things get a bit more complicated. So helping our users navigate that complexity is also a big piece. Yeah, Kate, so there's sort of overlap with digital humanities as well. Um, and a lot of digital humanities projects themselves call themselves archives, right? There's this blurring of the way that we use the term archives. Um, so we have people, you know, collecting digital records too and putting them online, virtual archives. Um, and there's like quite a lot of blurriness and gray zone then between digital humanities and archival work as well. Um, and then a lot of digital humanities scholars are using archival material, right, in doing their work. So very, very much so there is um, good synergy between those two. And we also have people um, in the book history and print culture program and in LIS, um, in some of the other concentrations that have digital humanities experience as well. So there's the opportunity to take courses in those areas. Are there any other questions or thoughts or anything, comments?
Okay. If there are no more questions, then we can um, we can probably end <laughs> and go on with our days. Ooh, thanks, Olivia. What kinds of prizes? And yeah, I'll just, my common practice, I'll see until everyone's gone. If anyone has questions, I'm still here until um, 3 o'clock. I think the next thing is at 3, you'll get a virtual tour, right? Good question, Olivia. Do you have a link to the survey or will it be emailed out? I believe it will be emailed out to participants at the end of the information day. That makes sense, yeah. Thank you all for coming um, and for terrific questions as well. I wish you really good luck um, if you decide to apply to the program and getting things together. And don't hesitate to get in touch if you do have any questions. Um, putting my email in the chat there. So I see it. Oh, thank you. I was just going to say, I was asking if you had questions. That might be a good question for Olivia. Do you mean in the profession or in the program? Maybe you mean in the profession. Okay. I can speak to the profession side of things, and then maybe I'll let Olivia speak to the programs like as a student. Um, the best, well, it really depends on what you love, but one thing that I love about the profession is it's lifelong learning. It, you're doing constant professional development. Um, as an archivist, like I would get to, you know, decide to take on that we're going to do outreach on social media, which we weren't doing when I joined the archives. And so now I have to research, you know, how to do that in a good way and what kind of material I want to draw on. Um, I get to work with different people to acquire their records. So I got to learn about astronomy and then about physics and then about political science. Um, you know, you decide to maybe learn more about how to work with photographic material or audiovisual or now digital records. Um, I decided to build a new descriptive system for the archives. And so I had to learn a lot more about databases and information management. There's just so many angles. Um, and throughout your career, you can kind of shift and move and take new things on. So to me, that was my favorite part. No two days were the same. Some days I would just be sitting records. Other days I'm teaching. Um, other days I'm putting together, you know, outreach plans or writing policy. Um, to me, that's what's really exciting. Records management as well, going out to offices, meeting with people, talking to them about what they do. You end up learning about HR and about finance, about all the different things that people do to support an organization. Um, to me, it's a very people-oriented job, and that's very um, exciting and fun. I don't really have much to say about the hardest parts um, because I love the profession so much. I mean, maybe what is difficult or challenging for me, at least, was that uh, legislation piece and really making sure um, that you're up on the legislation. One thing that a lot of people struggle with 
the judgment part, so appraisal, which I teach, is to me the most difficult function of an archivist um, and as a records manager, deciding how long records should be kept, deciding that you can throw things out, deciding what to keep requires um, a sense of self, sense of intuition, but also really strong understanding of the organization, of your professional responsibility. Um, to me, that's the most complicated part of our job because, you know, what we arrange and describe is only what we keep, what we choose to keep. And, and in choosing to keep some things, we're choosing to not keep other things. Um, so yeah, to me, that's one of the hardest ones. I don't know if Olivia, you have thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I guess one of the best parts, as I mentioned, uh, learning from my colleagues, I found I went through a lot of professional growth as a student just from conversing with my fellow students and learning about their experiences and what led them here. Uh, in addition, I like that there are so many different electives to choose from, and I feel like I can really cater my learning to my interests. So I've taken a conservation course on paper materials. I, I'm taking a digital curation course. Next semester, I'm taking a copyright course. And these are all things that I'm not only interested in, but I feel like I can bring into my future profession and I can use my course experience from my program in interviews to talk about what I've been learning about. Um, and I guess the hardest part, I mean, I guess it's, it's a difficult part of any master's program really is just about scheduling my time, you know, uh, organizing arrangements with group assignments versus completing more individual assignments. Um, that can be a little bit difficult, especially um, if you work part time, but it's definitely manageable. Um, I have found having an agenda and a calendar just to keep on top of my deadlines and my I sort of give myself start dates and end dates for my assignments just to better plan out my time and so that everything isn't left till the end for myself. Um, and that has been very helpful for me. But overall, I've been having a really great experience in this program. And that's what led me to want to volunteer at the information day, because when I was a prospective student, I came to these information days and hearing from students about their experiences really interested me to enroll into this program in the first place. Thanks, Olivia. Any follow up save for you? There's a, a few others in the room as well. Okay, if there's no other questions, then maybe we'll close out um, so that you have a few minutes to get to the tour, if that's okay. Um, so thank you for the, the rest of you that are here, um, and to Olivia and to Sydney too, who's here um, helping make sure that things move smoothly as well. Um, she's managing multiple <laughs> rooms at once. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody. And I hope we get to meet you in the fall. And thanks, Olivia, too. And thank